first of all, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know you're super busy when we were chatting. You said you were talking with Google and you know, you've been traveling a lot and the fact that you made time for me, I'm like super honored. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Sorry. It was a, a little challenging there, but here we are. Yeah, absolutely. Doing it regardless. So um, Game Changers has been <laughs> funny to say a game changer. I mean, like <laughs> all of my cycling friends while we're riding have come up to me and they're like, have you seen the Game Changers yet? And one of them didn't even know I was vegan. I'm like, they're like, would you even consider trying this? I'm like, yeah, I've been doing it for the last eight years. Um, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Not eight months, years. You're like, yep, and I'm still alive. <laughs> still alive and kicking it. And, you right, know, right. A, a lot of people specifically, like my cycling f friends specifically said, your portion of the documentary really found um, that inspiring. The fact that, th you know, the film showcased a successful cyclist, especially at the Olympic level, doing this, killing it. So I'm um, super honored to have you on. And as a cycling fan, I'm stoked to talk to, with you. Awesome. Are you, are you a road racer or mountain bike or? Yeah, I ride, yeah. I ride road and um, okay. I'm nowhere as near as competitive as you, but I did do a few cat, cat five races in Miami back in the day, um, which I don't know if you've ever ridden in Miami, but it's like, one of the best yet one of the worst places to ride because everyone is so sketchy there with the criteriums oh yeah i have not i can't say i have ever raced or even ridden in miami um i haven't done much in florida period it's su super flat you know so it would never be like a training destination necessarily and i don't know there really weren't that many great races in florida when um you know i was coming through the ranks um obviously the weather is good but <laughs> other than that I'm surprised they don't do more like flat stages there, like, you know, sprint type yeah. of stuff. But yeah. um, that it is fun, though, just getting in a big Peloton and just constantly, you know, rotating and um, just enjoying the flat. You know, I, I totally understand the hills is where it's at, though, with training wise, right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to go for a training camp, right, um, to, to, to really work on whatever it might be, whether it's base or high end or, you know, you need you want to have like a good variety of terrain as you're prepping for X, Y, Z race. Um, so yeah, yeah, just wouldn't. And I mean, I, I was in California the whole time. So I actually, I mean, I don't really have to go to any sort of destinations because we have pretty great weather all the time. And, you know, you can ride out outside, obviously 365 days and we've got amazing terrain, but you know, people that lived in, you know, the Midwest or something were seeking better weather and, and a more varied terrain would, you know, tend to go somewhere else in the winter time anyway. Definitely. And that's what I miss about Florida. Cause like now I live near DC and I miss that warm weather and like riding all year round. So that must be awesome. Oh, for, sure. for sure. No, I hear you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You, you get, you just, you get used to it, right? Like you get, <laughs> and then you just can't imagine it the other way. Yeah. Yeah, you do what you can. And, not, you know, I'm the one that like really hates the trainer. So like I just go to the gym during the winter time and ride during the summer. But yeah, you, know, you do what you can. But I wanted to ask you, um, so so did you did you grow up playing sports, by the way, or did, were you even vegan growing up? Oh, goodness. No, 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 no. I grew up in Kentucky, um, ate animals for 35 years of my life. Um, really just grew up traditional kind of middle-class all-American family. Uh, typical dinner would be, you know, boiled hot dogs and baked beans and <laughs> mac and cheese and, you know, iceberg lettuce with ranch dressing. So right. um, didn't, didn't have any um, plant-based eating in, in, in my, you know, my history before, uh, before I made this, this switch at 35. So, yeah. And, and as far as, as far as athletics goes, no, on that as well, I, I, I did grow up in a, a horse family, like my, my uncle and my grandfather were thoroughbred horse owners and trainers, and I grew up um, riding saddlebred, uh, saddle seat equitation, but I would consider the horse the athlete, not, not, not the rider, you know what I mean? So I grew up with competition in my blood and enjoying competition and, and a competitive spirit, but, you know, it's not that athletic of a sport for the human, you know, horseback riding. So, yeah. 
I hear you for sure. And um, I definitely want to get into all of your cycling, like we were talking about and, and, you know, working our way up to the Olympics. But I actually want to start the podcast off by just talking about maybe some of the other things most people might not know about you. And that's, you know, a, a little bit more of like the the darker years. Um, if you don't mind me bringing that up, maybe you could talk about a little bit about your eating disorder, I believe is during college and maybe some of the, you know, the drugs you were involved in and, and as well as the suicide attempt. I just want to like start, start off, you know, start things off where you came from and lead to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. And like, like so many people, um, you know, there's some dark spots in our past. Not everyone, but but most everyone, you know, there's, Absolutely. there's, there's spaces and, and, and places in our in our lives that we, you know, definitely took a lot of wrong turns and, and, and maybe spiraled down, um, maybe not all the way to a suicide attempt. Uh, but but, you know, many people pretty close. Right. D- really struggling um, from uh, severe depression and self-loathing and um, just not wanting to be in this space on this planet anymore so many people can understand that and it resonates for for more people than i wish it did you know um so i just took a spiral um i actually was was um graduating college i had majored in in journalism and was planning to go into uh being a reporter in hard news i'd had that dream for four or five years. And, and, you know, that's why I studied journalism in, in school. And I did an internship towards the end of my, um, the second semester of senior year, which I highly recommend doing internships uh, before that, in case you, in case you don't like them. So it was out uh, the waters. Yeah, for sure. And no, if you need to, if you need to make a shift. So I was a little day late and a dollar short on when I did the internship. But anyway, nonetheless, I did it. And I um, really, it, it came into, to my, um, uh, I recognized that that is very much not what I wanted to pursue. And basically, long story short, uh, as, as I was interning, uh, I, I started to realize that some really fantastic, rich, interesting stories were being hidden or covered up or not, um, didn't make, didn't see the light of day. And I, I, I started to recognize that there were powers that be kind of behind that hiding of, of some of those stories, whether it be the government or big business or, 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 you know, powerful industries, there was just, um, I just knew that we had some great stories to tell that the next thing I knew they were just, you know, had vaporized. They just were not going to be happening. They were not going to be played. They were not going to be aired. So I, I realized that, you know, the kind of the beat and hard news, uh, the way that we knew it probably 30 years before that uh, just wasn't reality anymore. And so that just sent me into a, a, a place of great fear, not knowing I was already hugely in debt with college loans. I couldn't go back and repeat a couple of years and, and major in something else. So I just was, I was scared. I was uh, um, overwhelmed and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life or what I was going to pursue. And so very slowly in the beginning, um, I started to assert control over my food intake, not thinking for a second about wanting to be thin or fat or medium size or large size or small size or anything in that realm. I just started controlling my food intake because I think I was desperate to have some kind of control in my life, some kind of control over my life, which I felt like I had just completely lost by right. not knowing what I was going to do with my life. So it was very sneaky, uh, the way that it, it came into my sphere and the way that the, the eating disorder started. But then quite quickly, it, it grabbed, you know, grabbed a stranglehold in my life. And I spiraled um, deeply into anorexia. And that spurred a drug habit that I had already been dabbling in, um, which, you know, drug of choice was cocaine for me at that period of time. And, uh, and just, you know, so then with the two of those together and and a lot of partying and a lot of, you know, loss of self worth, self worth, and a lot of uh, beating myself, beating myself down, I just um, spent some years there, I'd be basically worthless to the world. um, And, uh, you know, 
playing around in, in, in places and areas that I shouldn't have been. Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting because most people's um, stereotypical eating disorder will be like, you know, a girl that might want to lose weight or be super skinny. It doesn't sound like that was your experience. And it sounds like, you know, having control over your food was at the time, it seemed like a good idea for you because I'm sure maybe you felt the other about you felt bad about the other things you couldn't control with what you were studying, what you were learning and what was happening around in the world. Am I correct by saying that or? Yeah, no, I think that's spot on. Yeah. I just, it was, um, you know, we, I think most of us have fairly controlling personalities when it comes to ourselves, right? Like we want to be able to have control over our own life and our own decisions and the direction that we head in. And when that even feels, um, challenged, uh, it's a very unsettling, uh, very scary feeling. And especially at that age, um, yeah. you know, when I'm just supposed to be starting my whole life journey, right. In, in terms of what I'm doing with my life anyway. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, and I, I, you know, in our sport in cycling, you know, there, there it's, you know, anorexic anorexia and, you know, disordered eating certainly runs rampant in gravity challenge sports, let's say, and, and road cycling is definitely a gravity challenge sport. So I saw so m so many eating disorders, um, even more on the male side than the female side, um, cause there's more at stake on the male side, uh, you know, bigger salaries and bigger teams and, and, and more of a livelihood, uh, on the men's side of cycling. And so, um, I saw a lot of eating disorders unfold during, you know, my years as a competitive cyclist, um, for the reasons of what, you know, what you were speaking about, right. Of, of starting out and just wanting to lose weight and be thinner and smaller so you can climb sure. better, you know, it, it totally makes sense. I mean, sometimes like I'm afraid of like what a guy like Chris Froome might go through to get into the shape that he's in to win the tour de France. You know, I, I, I think about that sometimes I'm like, holy crap, what, you know, what goes behind the scenes? Not, you know, accusing Chris Froome of having an eating disorder or anything like that, but just, I'm sure like so many of those guys and gals want to lose weight on purpose for something greater or something that they really want. Um, and I am afraid of how many people sacrifice their health because of that. But I do want to ask you, Dotsie, um, how did you overcome these dark days, uh, how, how, what, when did you realize that you needed help and what did you do about it? Yeah, well, I, as you mentioned, it, you know, it, it the, that those couple of years ended with a suicide attempt of running out in the freeway and 76 freeway in, in, in Philadelphia. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously not succeeding that spiraled me into a bit of a wake up call um, in terms of what, you know, I, I didn't feel like I wanted to be on the planet anymore, which is obviously what led to that attempt. Um, but I, I realized after that attempt that I, I thought maybe I, I would be okay staying on the planet, just not in the form that I was in at that period of time. I didn't want to, um, you know, continue doing what I was doing and be, and taking up space on the planet. Uh, and I was very motivated by my family. Um, my family was, you know, in just so much distress while I was sick. They were, you know, extremely worried, as many families are when you see your daughter or your sister spiral like that. And so I just I kind of had this awakening where, you know, I didn't really think I would be able to get better, but I thought maybe I'll try because mm -hmm. if I don't make it and, and if I end up dying, at least my family will know that I gave it a try. And I somehow I rationalized that in my head as a good idea, you know, but reality, of course, I don't think it's going to matter to them if I'm gone, whether I tried or not beforehand, right? It's just, I would just be gone and they would miss me. So I, but I, you know, in my sick mind, I, I had rationalized that out. And so that was really the impetus for me 
starting to get some help. Um, I had gotten a lot of help before, but not help that I'd wanted. You know, my parents had, uh, my mom specifically um, had done an intervention a couple of times, but I was, you know, I was over 21. So it wasn't a lot that she could really do, but, uh, or make me do, I should say. Um, so there had been a lot of, I had seen therapists and gone to group therapy and, and, and different things like that, but I didn't want it. So when I really wanted it, uh, and wanted to try is, is, is when, you know, the whole unfolding of the healing journey began. But I tell people all the time, you know, yes, eventually you have to want it a hundred percent yourself to be successful, but it doesn't have to be the entry point. Like there can be another entry point, which for me was just, I'm going to try this for my family. I'm just going to give it a try and see if, see if maybe I can get a little bit better. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you get this asked a lot, but, um, what should one do if they or someone they know has an eating disorder? Because I myself, I'm a nutritionist and it comes up every now and then, but I think hearing it from someone who's gone through it and has overcome it uh, is really important. So what would you recommend uh, to those who are going through it or that know someone who's going through it? Well, I think those are two different suggestions, uh, quite honestly. So if you are going through it, um, I think it's really important to know, first of all, that there is hope and there is healing. Because personally, when I was in the middle of it, and all the different people that I know that have suffered or are suffering from an eating disorder, you really, truly feel in the middle of it, like there is no way out. You feel like you will always have an eating disorder of some degree. It just feels like there's no way that you could actually have a life outside of your anorexia or outside of your bulimia. Um, so just knowing that it would have helped me to know of people like me that had an eating disorder and, and, and made it to the other side. So just having that hope, it is possible. It is possible to, to get better and to heal and to live outside the confines of an eating disorder. And then secondly is to um, pick someone that you, that you trust and share, share your truth. And I know that's super scary and really hard and it's easier said than done. But if you can have somebody that that loves you just for you and has your best interests in mind, um, it it can be the spark that that helps to start that journey. If you just tell that one, just tell one person, and it doesn't have to be great detail. It can just be, hey, I'm struggling. I want to confide in someone. Um, can I talk to you? It, it's 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 incredible what happens once it is stated you know, once you share it with kind of your, the out, outside of you. Uh, and then if you know somebody that, that seems to be struggling from an eating disorder or full-blown eating disorder, or you've noticed disordered eating habits, uh, the most important thing not to say, which is, it seems, uh, it seems obvious, but it's so not, it's very common to say, hey, you're looking, fill in the blank. You're looking too skinny. You look gaunt. You look, um, your skin looks, you know, bad. You look, you know, you look this certain way. Yeah, because you need to gain some weight, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's the common thing because the, visually that's what you're seeing. And that's right. what you want to share with them that you're seeing. But that can fuel the eating disorder more because they're probably – you know, like for me, I got to where I just wanted to get small enough that I kind of disappeared and no one noticed me. That was like where, so if somebody had said, you're, you know, you're looking really small or you look like you're losing weight, I would have been like, yes, good. Mm -hmm. I'm getting there. That's my goal. So don't mention or talk about how they look or what they're eating or how much they're eating or how little they're eating. Don't talk about those things. Just say, hey, you seem to be struggling. You seem to be sad. Because most people that have that are in the middle of an eating disorder, they're, they're, I've never met somebody who's struggling and they're really, really joyous. It's mm -hmm. just not they right. go hand in hand. So if you know somebody well enough, you're going to you seem sad. You seem down. You seem like you might be struggling with something. I'm here. I love you. You can trust me. That's it. Right. That's all you can do is give them that that um, 
that experience of love and that experience that you're there for them, no matter what, no matter what they need or how long it takes or whatever it is. And I think that's, um, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like you want to say, Hey, you're not eating and you look too skinny and let's go for a cheeseburger. You know, it's like, right. because people yeah. want to, you yeah. love someone and you want to take action, right? Like you're like, oh, sure. let's fix this tomorrow. This is crazy. I want you to feel better and look better and be better. So it's, it is a bit of the opposite of just, just showing, just showing love and letting them know that you're there and they can just reach out anytime. Right. Not providing answers, but providing support is what it sounds like. Um, absolutely. Uh, and how old were you? You must've been in your young twenties, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It. it was like 20, 21, 22, 23 in there, 24. Yeah. And, and were you around 26 years old when you first got into cycling? That's correct. Yeah. It was right around the end of my, um, you know, journey of, of, of coming out of my anorexia and healing from it. And, um, I actually started cycling with, by the suggestion of my therapist. So oh, no way. It, was, it was kind of a random, she, she just said, you know, I, I think she knew that there was a competitor in there somewhere, right? Like she knew my history and she knew that I was a competitive, um, saddlebred horseback rider for, for many years. And, and, um, that I was living it out in Los Angeles and that I just, you know, she wanted me to be able to move my body in a healthy way. Again, it was anorexia. I definitely had the over-exercising part of that disorder, which was, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day in the gym, just, you know, pummeling my body. And so she just, you know, for, for true and complete healing, she wanted me to say, okay, you know, I can move my body healthfully, whatever it is a few times a week and that feel good and not, you know, instigate, uh, anorexia. So she just told me to pick, um, an activity. I, I think she called it an activity. I don't even think she called it a sport. Um, yeah. but like a, some kind of, you know, a- outdoor activity that, and so I just chose cycling. I said, well, what about I get a bike? Because I've, ne- I haven't had a bike since I was like, you know, 10 and you know, the banana seat bike that you ride around in, in, in your neighborhood. <laughs> cruisers. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's rad. That's awesome. It sounds like cycling was your therapy in a way. Yeah, I think it was. I think it still is. Uh, that is freaking awesome. In life, just uh, if I go on a really hard mountain bike ride, um, you know, just I just come back and all sorts of things in my life are back in order and make sense. <laughs> Whereas they didn't before I went out the door. <laughs> you know, you know, all the cycling. Oh, absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And And you know what's funny in a way? Um, when, when you first started cycling at that time, you were older than, uh, when Peter Sagan at that time, he won, um, his world championship. I think he was 25 years old and you were, you were 26. You just got into this. So like all the people that are like, oh, you know, it's too late for me and all that. Um, when you say like, that's total BS, just get into it. And today's the day. It's all, today's always the day. That is for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. It's it's today. And you just never really know what's going to unfold. I mean, I, you know, it would be, I mean, it was the farthest thing from anything that I would have ever dreamt up when I started cycling to know that 13 years later, there would have been an Olympic podium. I mean, you know, I would have just laughed That's out insane. loud. As would everybody that knew me back then. You know what I mean? It's like, no, this is just a fun way to exert some energy and feel healthy kind of thing. So, um, you just, you just never know. I mean, like when I was reading Lance Armstrong's book, um, he, like, I remember reading, I think he was 14 years old or maybe even younger when he first started getting into cycling. Like, is this typical, uh, or do people start later, like in their twenties, like you do? Um, no. So I think that, so professional, professionally speaking, you know, if you make it to the professional ranks, men tend to, to be around the age when Lance started, right? Like you'll, most of the pro men, they'll say, oh, in Europe, even earlier. I mean, in Europe, they'll tell you they started right. at four. Um, in, in the States, they'll tell you they started at 12 or 13 uh-huh. or 14 kind of thing. Uh, women, I m- notice they mostly start in high school or first year of college. So, you know, I would say I was, I was nine or 10 years older starting than, than most of my competitors, right? Like, cause maybe they, most of them started 
uh, 16, 17, 18 kind of thing. It. Is there a reason why there's um, discrepancy in there? Uh, like men and women, why they start at such a different age? I don't know if you would, if you've heard of anything. Well, I just think it's definitely because, uh, you know, traditionally speaking, and, and certainly, you know, with, with equal rights uh, for, for both genders or all genders, um, we're, we're, we're trying to move uh, in a new direction. But, um, you know, history tells us that, uh, you know, the men's track in professional cycling um, is can be a route to uh, a lot of money and a lot of fame and setting up your life and, and, and it being a real um, true living. Whereas women's professional cycling has historically not <laughs> given that right. to women. So women tend to go to college and get a degree. And then, you know, if they're cycling and they're, you know, kind of going through the ranks and they're loving it, then maybe they take a break. But, you know, most women in the professional ranks, I would say, I don't, at least 80% of them have a college degree because they knew that this that cycling was not going to be what takes them to fame and fortune. Mm. Um, whereas men, most of them have skipped college. The, the, the ones that are, you know, high level professionals, they have definitely skipped college in pursuit of the dream. Um, so that's, I think that's the main Yeah, reason. I never even thought about that. I mean, I guess like big names like Peter Sagan or Chris Froome, like they would probably do just fine, like going all in. But I imagine some of the like other less well-known professional cyclists, you know, um, if they get kicked off the team, I never thought about that. What do they do? Yeah, well, I think that's, that's you know, why we've seen the perpetuation of uh, this male-centric sport is because, one of the reasons anyway, uh, you know, like I said, men usually don't have, uh, you know, higher education degree. So when they retire at, you know, 32 or 35, so right. Cause it's not like, you're, right. Then their options are to go back and get a higher education degree, which many by that point don't want to go back to school and sit with the, you know, 19 year olds. And, and so most of the men, they go right back into the cycling industry, right? They become me mechanics, they become directors, yeah. um, they become, you know, team organizers. So it's, they, they're, they're right back into the, the system because that's all they know. And so you just have this perpetuation of male uh, dominance within the sport because it's men running everything. So uh, when we were talking before, it sounded like you started off in road, correct? How did you get into track cycling and what made you not want to go towards like the world tour uh, route? Um, well, back in my day, there wasn't a world tour for the women. So that, I mean, there were um, really epic stage races. Like we had a women's Giro d'Italia, which I did a couple of times. We had, um, you know, a, a, like a women's version of, of the Tour de France Um uh, and, and incredible, but there, there wasn't an actual women's world tour like there is now. Uh, so, but I did race all those big races. Like I was on the, what would you would, you would say would be the equivalent of like the women's world tour. I was on, um, uh, the women's national team and then we were sponsored by T-Mobile. And so that we were, I, I did race that tour. That's, that's, that's what I did for, um, you know, the, the second, you know, the first five years of my career was, you know, serious domestic getting dropped every race mm -hmm. I did. Um, so badly that a couple of times the director of the women's national team would wait for me at the finish line. And the first time I was so off the back that he started calling local hospitals because he thought I'd crashed out there, but I just was so dropped. So, wow. <laughs> I definitely started, well, I started too, so late, right? Like, so these women that I'm on the team with, right? It's, um, you know, Kimberly Baldwin and Kristen Armstrong and Amber Neben and they, their entire, they had started, um, you know, high level sports at a really mm -hmm. young age, not necessarily cycling, right? Like, like Amber was a high school and college runner. And so their cardiovascular systems were built at a really high level, from many, many years, mine was just starting to get built. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was their slave until I would get dropped. Uh, but then towards the end of my road career, you know, I was, I won some, you know, stage yeah. races and stages of stage races and what, stuff what like that. What made you so. want to try track? Was it just something like you thought it might be a cool experience or did you feel like you were more suited towards that type of riding? Well, a, two 
reasons. One was I was really finding out that I was definitely suited towards that, um, let's call it like middle distance where you have a combination of your aerobic and anaerobic system at play uh, because I won some massive international prologues. So, right, short time trials, right? Like the like really, really big time ones in, in Europe and in Australia. So that was a little bit of an indicator where my coach at the time said, I think you might want to try the pursuit on the track. Like this is really, you know, where your talent well seems to be, seems to lie. Um, but the second reason was because I went to the track and it, it scared me so severely that I wanted to conquer that fear. Mm -hmm. um, because it's banked, right? It's 44. It just it still makes no sense to me that the tires stick when you go around it in a 44 degree banking. Um, so I just, it's was super really, scary too. Super that, no, that's what I was drawn to. I, I was just, it was so scary that, um, I just thought what a great challenge to see if I can overcome this fear. Uh, and you know, so I still was scared of it the, all the, the whole time. I'm still scared. I never did overcome the fear, but, but I tell you what, it, it's, it's a, it's an incredible thrill, um, to be, to, to have that fear, um, and to, you know, kind of come out the other side and, and, and have success in a, in, in a place where you, um, a lot of fear resides. Yeah, right on. Um, and then, uh, how did the Olympics come into play? How were you selected for that? Um, well, just, a, just a typical route in terms of, you know, it, I was, you know, training, I, I was on the team pursuit national team and, you know, there's a lot of girls that want the spots for the Olympics and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's brutal, the, the, the journey, cause you're, especially in team pursuit or any team sport, right? So, I mean, if you're soccer or volleyball or whatever the team sport might be, you're, you're fighting for the spots, but you're also only as strong as, um, the cohesiveness of the team. So your teammates, through and through and that's the only way you're going to beat the other countries is playing together yeah. you know but up until you know the olympics you're 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 fighting for the spot so it it was um you know it, it, that that was a, a really rough journey for yeah. for all of us you know to, for that final selection but i made the final selection obviously so were you vegan at this point um i was mostly plant based i i switched over uh, in 2010 and Olympics were 2012. So yeah. So the last couple of years, I mean, the, the track journey started for me in 2007. So, you know, n not the whole time, but, but the last couple of years leading into Olympics. Yes. For sure. And I, I know right off the bat, you said, um, in plenty of other interviews, you did this for ethical reasons, not for health reasons. Um, you had found out about basically how the how meat and dairy and other animal products like eggs are produced and you just were not cool with that. So you decided to leave that off your plate. But um, did you notice any health benefits uh, specifically on the bike um, after switching to a plant-based diet? Oh, geez. Yeah. Well, you've seen Game Changers. So, I mean, it, yo, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Repeatability, the, the length of time in um, between repeatability of efforts significantly sped up like the uh, you know so the time that I needed to repair and recover in between efforts in between weightlifting sessions in between intervals um also overnight recovery you know I I used to joke that I couldn't train until 10 because you know you know how it feels I would normally wake up uh and you feel hung over yeah. uh, you've trained so hard the day before right track cycling you're, you're training at least two times a day and sometimes three times a day and so you know i would wake up just feeling so lethargic and so inflamed and just so groggy and just you know it'd take me you know two or three hours to really feel like i could have a good um you know session on the bike but after switching over to a plant-based diet, I didn't wake up feeling like that anymore. I mean, I just, you know, my inflammation um, obviously, you know, significantly decreased. And I woke up, I kind of bounced out of bed. I had more energy. I had more stamina. I had a brighter mm -hmm. outlook, quite honestly. Like I just felt lighter and brighter and <laughs> more, uh, you know, more able. And um, so because, you know, what you put in your body greatly directs your mental health. We're getting so much more information now on understanding how our gut flora and our gut microbiome, the trillions and trillions of little live bacteria that live in our gut and our colon and how they direct, um, 
everything from our serotonin to our dopamine uh, levels. And, and that is obviously, um, you know, has a tight connection with our mental health um, and our outlook on life and, um, you know, fighting or warding off uh, depression or, or depressive feelings. So, um, so many things change that, you know, from, from my head to my toes, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, for those that are listening that might be new to all this plant, you know, in, ter in terms of plant-based eating, which you can bet I'm going to send this to all my cycling friends after this. Um, <laughs> tell me, what, what does a typical day of eating look like for you, especially back in the days of the Olympics? And what supplements do you take or would you recommend to any competitive cyclist? Sure. Yeah. So I the food that I leaned into, I mean, I think I might just direct people to um, our switchforgood.org, which is my nonprofit, which, you know, they, they can learn about it if they go there, but I would specifically direct them to, um, I, in, in nine bowls that we just put out last week, um, that were specifically made, um, for switch for good, uh, by, a, a plant-based chef and myself, um, that is e that are easy, delicious, nutritious, and super flavorful. Uh, we, we put them together so that people could understand the simplicity uh, and that plant-based eating doesn't have to be complex and you don't have to spend a long time in the kitchen. And basically they're, they're bowls that are, uh, the flavors are based off of the different places around the world that I race. So we have a Latin bowl and a Mediterranean bowl and a Scandinavian bowl. Uh, and it's literally just layers of food. So it starts with the grain and then on top of that are greens, different types of greens and then legumes and then maybe roasted vegetables with a salsa on top and a cashew cream sauce. Um, so super simple, really easy stuff that you can prepare in advance or, or, you know, that some that you don't even need to have anything prepared in advance, just like whatever is in the kitchen, you can kind of make this flavorful layered bowl um, and then topped with, um, you know, different seeds and nuts. Uh, in a lot of them. So I would lean people to, to looking up good bowls um, on switchforgood.org. And then, you know, I, supplement wise, the, the only thing that I take that everybody should be taking nowadays, whether you are a uh, carnivore or herbivore, uh, is a B12. Um, B you know, B12 is a bacteria. Animals do not make B12 in their bodies. Uh, they consume it. Um, and it's, mostly being killed off, you find B12 and that bacteria running in, you know, rivers and streams. And um, so, you know, the animals are, are, are drinking it or eating. And so you get it through their flesh. Um, when you're on a plant-based diet, you would get it through, um, you know, the dirt that's on your cucumber or the dirt that's on your potato. But we just, you know, wash everything um, to the ends of the earth in today's time, right? Like you're, you scrub all your vegetables because you want to get whatever else they put on there too, pesticides and whatnot. Um, right. We're not getting... Uh, as much B12 and the animals aren't eating as much B12 either um, because um, everything from yeah. pesticides to herbicides to even laundry detergent and pharmaceuticals and antibiotics are found in our streams and waters. And um, so it's killing the bacteria, including the B12. So animals aren't even getting as much B12. So um, yeah, what whatever diet you're eating uh, in, in, in today's modern times, you, you know, most people need to be leaning into to taking a B12. So I take a liquid B12, but that's all I take. What's funny is that there's even B12 supplements for animals that are being raised for meat, which a lot of people don't know that that goes into their feed or there's injections for these animals um, to have adequate B12 levels. And it's like, if the cows that you're eating aren't even getting enough B12, how do you expect you're going to get enough? But that's a topic for a different uh, day, I think. Right, right. <laughs> um, but how about like supplements, uh, like sports supplements? Do you recommend like electrolytes or do you take a protein supplement or anything along those lines? I don't personally take any type of protein supplement. Like I, you know, I've, I've learned throughout the journey of a plant-based diet that if I'm, if I'm getting enough calories, I'm getting enough macronutrients, which means I'm getting enough protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Like if I'm eating a full, well-balanced, super colorful, micronutrient rich diet, I'm getting plenty of protein. Like I don't have to protein weenie out. Like I just, you know, it's not a thing anymore. Like I don't stare at my yeah. 
protein number <laughs> that I'm getting it in. Right. But I eat a wide variety of foods. And, you know, if for some reason you're somebody that's super picky and doesn't eat a wide variety of all sorts of different types of foods and legumes and nuts and seeds and grains, and then maybe look at your protein content. But if you're not super picky and you are, then I don't even think it's something you need to worry about. Um, when I was an athlete, sometimes I would take a protein powder only because I, you, you need so many calories, uh, to put back in from what you've expended that sometimes I would literally just get tired of eating. And so I want to drink, mm -hmm. drink the calories to get, to get some in maybe at the end of the day, if I was at a deficit. Um, but now as just somebody who just, you know, you know, works out much more moderately, I, I don't ever take in any, you know, protein powders, but electrolytes, of course, on the bike. I mean, you know, yeah, if I do a hot yoga class, I'm, I'm going to get some electrolytes in, not just plain water. Um, but, uh, yeah, other than that, there's, I'm not a big, I really don't believe in this reductionist approach that people, um, you know, I think especially athletes have in their head, which is reducing nutrients down to single nutrients, because all of the nutrients in, in our diet and, and in a whole food plant-based diet, they work in tandem. They work with each other. Calcium works with magnesium and potassium and boron and strontium to give you strong bones, right? Iron works vitamin C. Um, so if when you start reducing single nutrients out in a pill, I think you just you're just flushing your money down the toilet because it's not, it doesn't work in your body the way that nature intended it to as a singular supplement micronutrient. So I, I'm not a big believer in, in taking pills. I'm just a believer in eating food. Yeah, no, I love that. I love how simple you keep it. And I think Dr. Campbell said it best. It's a symphony of nutrients, not a reductionist uh, like, approach, you know, just like you mentioned. Um, and, uh, and Dati, I know you're, um, you know, you have, uh, some things to do here, so I don't want to keep you, but I have a few more questions. One's actually really nerdy that only cyclists I think would appreciate. But, um, if you could remember back in, uh, in your peak, like let's say at the Olympics, do you remember what, what your, uh, FTP, your max heart rate, and as well as your maximum calories that you were burning in a day were? God, I don't remember. I don't totally. My FTP was like. 280 or something like that for 20 minutes is how I, um, right. Right. Um, to get off the line in my event, I had to put out about 850, uh, Watts and then sustain on the front, um, 480 Watts, oh, right shy of 500 to keep, to, to be at Jeez. speed, the speed that we went at Olympics. Um, and then, uh, I was moving through, dependent on the day right but but upwards of 5,000 calories for sure in in somewhere between wow. 4,000 and 5,500 um on super hard you know kind of three workout a day days it was a lot it felt like a lot which is why I drank some of it because it was like I cannot chew anymore you know there's just like so much it's almost impossible yeah <laughs> yeah it's almost yeah, how impossible you, you're right how are you gonna get down that many potatoes and rice it, it's just yeah, it's so hard to imagine. Um, even back in my days, like when I was like super active on the bike. But um, yeah, awesome. Do you remember by any chance what your max heart rate was? I don't know if you tracked that or. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I first started, um, the highest I ever saw was 212. But then, of course, as I, as I went along and got older, um, you know, it, it's I mean, it's probably well, I don't know what it is now, but I bet it's not even 180. Um, so towards the end of my career, seeing the low 190s was like, wow, you know, I'm really getting up there kind of thing. 212 is high. I think I've hit 205 and I was um, I think I was 26 at the time when I hit that. Uh, but geez, that's awesome. Um, well, well, yeah, so I think I, I didn't have a very low resting. Everybody kind of has their window, right? Like there. So I mean, uh -huh. my resting was never under 50, but my, you know, and most people, if you, if, if somebody has a resting that they can hit 38 or something, usually yeah. they're not go their, their highest heart rate is not going to be 212. It's going to be 202 or so, or, you know, so it just was my kind of window of, of what, you know, my body did. For sure. Yeah. So, so the thing with cycling, um, which I'm sure many of the cyclists listening would know, but, um, it takes you know, a mindset that allows you to suffer 
on the bike. And that's the only way to succeed, especially in the professional level like you. Um, to connect everything, what do you, how do you think your past with having an eating disorder, with everything that you went through, all the dark times, how do you think that translated to helping you s- suffer on the bike? Do you think um, any of that played a role? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I have a high suffering, um, just, you know, mind, body, and spirit. It's just how I'm built. So, uh, yeah, most definitely. It, it was uh, it played in the, on the bike. I, I think it just also was like, you know, on the bike, it was like, okay, this is never going to be as terrible as it was before the suffering part. And it's always going to end, right? Like the race always ends, the interval always ends. But when I was in my eating disorder, I didn't know when it was going to end or if it was going to end. So it was a lot easier to suffer on the bike. Yeah. I mean, pushing four or 500 Watts in the front. I mean, that, that takes a lot. Was there anything like you would think about when you were in the zone per se, and you were pushing all those Watts? Is there anything you you would think about or, or just, something you would say to yourself to like, keep you going? Well, on the track, no, I, I mean, it, 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 it's, there's no, there are no moments to kind of like, you know, think about things in your life, you know, like, I, it, no, but pre, you know, going to the line and clipping in and, and out of the start gate, you know, I had a whole like system of um, mental preparation that I would go through. But yeah, when I was out there, it was like, just it's so intense and just so you know it's 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 a short event right it's like three minutes 50 seconds so there's not really um you're just hyper 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 focused on your job at hand for sure yeah and i'm sure those even those like three minutes probably feel like three seconds with how intense everything is oh for sure that goes by really fast really fast well, right on. Um, that's that's everything I got for you, Dotsie. Uh, but I want to give you the spotlight. Is there any final thoughts that you had, stuff that we had we didn't cover that you want to touch upon? And um, where can people find you? Oh no, I think you did a magnificent job on touching on the hot points that your audience would would want to uh, would want to know. Um, and yeah, so I'm just at Vegan Olympian, which is pretty easy on Instagram. And uh, my nonprofit, if people want to lean in more to plants and a little bit out of uh, so many animal foods, uh, they'll find a lot of resources and a lot of great help and encouragement on um, my nonprofit that I mentioned earlier. So switchforgood.org, and it's for like the number four. So switchforgood.org. Awesome stuff. And by the way, I love that Instagram handle. So jealous, even though I would never like, you know, be able to have that. But um Dasi, thank you so much for coming on and I'll have um, the website to sw- switch for good and all your stuff in the show notes below. And uh, if you're up for it, um, let's uh, let's chat again. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, have a great evening. Absolutely. You do the same. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye bye.